All right. Well, I am up and recording. I do expect we'll have some more people joining us here in a little bit. And then, of course, we'll be posting this uh, sometime after we're done. Um, do want to remind people that uh, we have another webinar planned for next week. It is with uh, Sound Exchange uh, and Travis. He had to uh, change his schedule last week. Uh, and so we moved it to Tuesday. It'll be Tuesday at one o'clock Eastern, another webinar. Um, so uh, let's get rolling on this one. We're very excited to have uh, our uh, panel today for this. Um, for the Race, Academia, and the Struggles of Black Journalists, a webinar forum. And our uh, panelists, Ngozi Akirno from Texas Wesleyan University, Janai Plattenberg from Auburn University, and uh, Lily Fears, uh, Arkansas State University. I forgot to put the doctor in front of all three of you, but you all three have the doctor in front. So thank you very much for being here today for this. And at this point, um, I want to remind you that uh, if you want to ask a question, use the raised hand to get that. And by that, in the bottom right hand corner of your panel, there's reactions and such that you can do there. Um, and then uh, also mute your mics, which it looks like everybody has at this point, except for our panelists. So thank you very much for joining us, both as the uh, people who are here to watch and for our panelists. And I will now turn it over to our panelists. All right, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, John. And thank you, Stephen, for putting this together. We appreciate you and um, we hope that at the end of this presentation that we can have um, a great conversation going on as in regards to race um, um, and um, our field right now. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you all see the screen I'm sure? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, of course, just like, um, you know, um, all three of us we've worked on this, and so thank you for being here. Um, so we want to just make it known up front that this is a, um, a judgment-free zone, okay? So um, we're all here to learn from each other, um, you know, talk about these issues that is plaguing the country and plaguing, um, you know, all of us somehow at this point. So please, um, this is a judgment-free zone and we're open to new ideas and perspectives. So um, there's no judgment. If you believe that you've spoken, you can take back. Um, and of course, you can speak from a personal perspective as much as possible. Um, that would be very helpful. So some of the things we'll try to cover today, we'll um, have some definitions, we'll talk about perspectives, um, we'll talk about the experiences um, of a black tenure um, track faculty and journalist, uh, we'll talk about promoting multiculturalism and inclusion in the classroom and on campus, we'll have reflections from students and academics, and we'll have an open forum and talk about other spheres of influence. So um, I will begin or continue the conversation. Uh, so um, all of these images that I have on here, um, they are uh, to an extent familiar to us. So on February 23rd, um, 2020, um, Ahmed Abri, um, an unarmed 25 year old African American male was fatally shot in Georgia while jogging. So we know that Abri was chased and confronted by two white males, Travis uh, McMichael and his father Gregory. Um, and they were armed and driving a pickup truck. So we know that the McMichaels were not arrested until 74 days later. And after the video of the shooting went viral, um, Amut, uh, that's when they got arrested. 
and Amut's death basically sparked debates on racial profile in the United States. Now, fast forward um, to March 13, 2020, Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old African-American EMT, um, was fatally shot by Louisville Metro Police Department, LMPD. Um, they basically entered her apartment in Louisville, Kentucky, and under the authority of a search warrant. Sorry, I have this notification coming in here. Um, so gunfires were exchanged between Taylor's boyfriend and, you know, um, who he actually claimed that the, the officers were um, unmarked. They were not in uniforms. They were plain clothed and they didn't announce themselves. And eight bullets went into Breonna um, Taylor and she died. On, um, she died. Fast forward again, May 25th, 2020. A 46-year-old unarmed black man was killed after a white police officer um, knelt on his neck while he begged for his life, um, said he couldn't breathe and cried that his stomach and his whole body hurts. Yet, um, like an animal, the police officer remained over him, hands in pocket for eight minutes and 46 seconds um, while the other police officer stood by. Now, these are names that we know about in 2020. Not to talk about the many other black and minority bodies who have been killed by police or by other people who feel more superior and believe they have the power to take other people's lives. So because of the color of their skin. Or black and minority bodies who have been harassed, disrespected, treated less than humans, wrongfully accused and locked up in jail. Their freedom and liberty taken away. For instance, Trayvon Martins, Eric Garner, Tamara Rice, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, um, Atiana Jefferson, Ajibade Matthews, Walter Scott, too many names to mention. And according to mappingpoliceviolence.org um, in 2015 alone, um, the police killed at least 104 unarmed Black um, uh, people. Now, to provide more context, I would like to um, define um, some terminologies, um, beginning with race. So race is a social construct and is often used to describe and qualify people. You know, at various times, race has been used to separate people according to how it suits society, um, basically suggesting it is very, very temporal and it's fluid. For instance, after the First World War I, uh, First World War in which um, there was a huge wave of, of migration, causing fear and panic about the people coming to um, America. Jewish people were considered an inferior race compared to their Nordic or um, um, their Nordic descent, uh, people from um, uh, Nordic descent. So we're talking about like um, Norway, Sweden. Um, so this ideology was promoted by wealthy Protestants, whites and middle-class non-immigrants. Um, there was so much mistrust and anti-Semitism as the Jews who came in as refugees already lost their lands and of course properties to the Nazis. Even after President Woodrow um, Wilson nominated Louis D. Brandes, um, a Jew, to the Supreme Court in 1916, not much changed. So it was after World War II, um, as the Jews began to grow in status and socioeconomic placements, that his stigmatization softened and in fact, now Jews are sometimes considered, are considered as white. So basically we can see that it's a social construct, right? Um, which, of course, African Americans, by the virtue of their skin, have not achieved. So, when we talk about um, ethnicity, also is an important part of the discourse, right? Um, ethnicity and race—they are both social constructs, right? The difference is that ethnicity mostly relates to the culture and cultural affiliations and history of a people. So, sometimes when you articulate or speak English, you are told you don't sound black or, you know, when you are respectful and calm, right? You are told those kinds of things. Oh, you don't sound black. Oh, you sound different and those kinds of stuff. So basically, um, you don't sound like people who, based on the stereotype or that fit a particular culture, right? Um, so let's talk about racism. So racism is the belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and uh, capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Now, racism is a combination of racial prejudice and bias against a particular set of people, thus power and control, 
And as Webster Dictionary has indicated that they will be adjusting the definition, um, that power and uh, that power and control basically comes with um, systemic oppression. So Blacks in America have been boxed in by a system that makes it even harder to break the glass ceiling from slavery to Jim Crow to segregation, um, the loophole in the 13th Amendment, jail system, police brutality, redlining, lack of infrastructures in Black neighborhoods, including good educational facilities, um, limitations to owning homes and building wealth, and so forth and so forth. Um, so, uh, um, I would like to combine prejudice and bias, um, knowing that with preformed notions um, really based on stereotypes and a lack of diverse representations, um, one tends to treat minority groups with partial um, judgment. Um, privilege is basically an unearned social power, set of advantages, entitlements, and benefits accorded by the formal and informal institutions of society, right, to the members of a dominant group. So it tends to be invisible. Sometimes you don't even recognize it. You don't even know you possess it um, because it's, abs uh, um, it's absence, but it's basically a lack of privilege is what calls attention to it. So this reminds me of um, Amy Cooper, which we all know about recently, right? Um, Amy Cooper, a woman in the park who was told to put her dog on a leash um, by a black man. Yet her response, you think that, you know, that's an okay thing to say to someone, hey, you know, this is the park policy or rules, put your dog on a leash, right? But her response basically was that she would call the police and tell them that she and her dog were being threatened by an African-American man, right? Um, so this means she understood her privilege and the consequence of using these specific terms, being threatened by an African man, uh, African-American man. So the question is, how do we use our privilege and to what extent are we using to use our privilege to harm others? Amy Cooper is just one of many incidents of white folks calling the police on minority folks. The countless examples and videos that we've seen over and over again, right? Um, so more perspective, when you talk about um, 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 Black Americans, basically they are nearly three times more likely to die from police um, than white Americans, right? Um, black folks are almost one and a half times more likely to be unarmed compared to white people, right? In 2019, 24% of all police killings were of black Americans, although only 13% of the US population is black. So basically this indicates an 11 point discrepancy, right? 99% of killings by People, um, police from 2013 to 2019 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. So we come and we talk about the George Floyd protest. Um, it is not just about George Floyd, but about more than 400 years of oppression dating back to 1619, or even depending on literature you look at, dating back to 1400s. So the average age of um, Ahmaud um, Abri, Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd is a little over 30. Now, we teach and advise students in their teens and early 20s who basically watch these videos and endure or um, they know people who have endured police brutality, white privilege, microaggression, systemic racism um, that undermines and limits their growth. Students who may have been you know, suggested to countless times that their lives do not mean much and um, that justice may never be um, served when they are victims. Now, we teach students whose representations in the media are limited and hardly see um, representations of themselves in places of power or even in their college campuses or newsrooms sometimes. Um, so students who do not know if they will make it to 30 um, to use some of the skills that they've learned from our campuses or from our classrooms. So this all adds up, right? The pain, the hurt, the fear of walking safely in your neighborhood, they all add up. We know that um, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So as faculties, as, as advisors, if a student basically presents a story with a beginning and a partial middle, we would say that the story is incomplete, right? Um, so I believe strongly that higher education 
um, us as advisors, as faculty, we have great, um, a great role to play to be a part of the change by telling complete stories. So it begins with wanting to take active steps, um, talking, listening, and learning, checking our biases, setting up structures, and um, award systems to promote diversity and inclusion. Um, basically promoting diverse representations in our syllabi, classrooms, and newsrooms, and providing balanced coverage for all. And maybe, just maybe, um, our young ones, um, the next generation, we can all begin to um, treat each other um, better. So uh, I'll hand over to Janai right now. Okay. Um, well, before I get into the meat of, of my presentation today, this section of the presentation at least, I feel like I, need sh I should share a little bit more about my background and what I'm bringing into this um, because my background is very much entrenched in the discussion of diversity, um, both in terms of academia and my, my life as a journalist. Um, and I'm also coming to this from a position of uh, vulnerability based on uh, my, my current demographics and position. Um, so I started out full-time working as a journalist, um, worked in both print and broadcast. Um, many times I was the only Black in the newsroom. Um, the One of my, my previous employers um, is the second oldest newspaper in the state of Texas, and I think I was only like the third or fourth black employee that had been hired there and that was in 2009 and so just to kind of give you some perspective there um majority of what i ended up covering um kind of ran the gamut um, i specialized in covering demographics and diversity courts and police politics all things in which race is usually a, a big um you know impactful factor factor in those 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 subject matters um leaving there ended up coming back to school um to grad school got my doctorate in um, media and public affairs and my research including my dissertation focuses on the intersection of race and media particularly black identity and media and so i say that to share that all that i i do and i am again is very much entrenched in this conversation and so um and I'm currently an assistant professor of journalism at Auburn University. And so I'm not tenured yet. <laughs> I'm on the tenure track, but I'm not there yet. And so that puts me in another place of, of vulnerability, which I'll talk about um, why that, that makes a difference. Um, next slide, Dr. Ngozi. Oh, okay, that one's not mine. <laughs> I think it went a little too far. That's not it. Okay. Okay. Let me hold on, y'all. I'll I'll open it up on my end. Go ahead. Okay. One second. Um. Okay, can y'all see that? Can y'all see my screen now? Okay, all right. So before I get into it, I wanna share um, a few numbers, few statistics that may put our conversation also into perspective today. Um, so coming at this, you know, both in terms of being a black journalist and in terms of being a black faculty member. Um, and so if we're talking about diversity, um, less than 6% of full-time faculty members at institutions across the country are black. Um, from 2002 to 2017, of the roughly 50,000 people who earn PhDs each year, the percentage who were Black slightly increased. So the numbers are increasing, but very slowly. Um, we still make up the minority in, in the larger scheme of things. In 2017, there were more than a dozen fields, um, largely subfields within the STEM areas, in which not one single doctorate was offered um, to a Black individual anywhere in the United States if you think about that. And that's just 2017, that's just a few years ago. Um, 
to piggyback on that, in terms of faculty, 37,862 African Americans serve in full-time faculty positions um, as of the latest data of 2007. Um, while there is no database um, that keeps track of tenure denials, we know that minorities, um, particularly Black faculty members tend to get denied tenure at a higher rate than their, their colleagues of other races. Um, and just 6% of full-time faculty members were Black um, and 5% being Latino as of 2017. And I didn't put that on there, but it's as of 2017. Um, and so one other in terms of speaking about tenure, um, Amherst College, as I said, there's not a national database that keeps track of tenure denials um, and, and those who have been promoted, but Amherst College student journalists actually did an um, examination and they looked at tenure denials from fall 2000 to fall 2016, and they found that 30 black faculty members were 33 times as likely to be, de to be denied tenure as their white colleagues. So it's a pretty significant number, especially when you're thinking about those who are actually awarded tenure um, and those who are denied and black faculty members being very much so on the end of not receiving that and leaving the university. And so if we're talking about things like our discussions about um, retention and attrition, while they're being hired you know, at a slow rate, they are being hired, but they're not uh, being there for the long term if they're being denied tenure and they're on tenure track. And so, um, and so again, I wanted to set the foundation um, to share the, the community and the outlook of where I'm coming from, where I'm positioned, um, before I got into sharing some of my personal experiences, as well as sharing some of the experiences of friends and colleagues that I've heard, because um, we all have the same story. We're at different institutions, things, people I've seen in online communities that I'm a part of, um, different, same stories, different person for the most part. And so some of the things that I have experienced fall under some of these general categories, myself and others. So when I'm, I'm speaking kind of on behalf of our community here. Um, but one big thing that you know, I've, I've experienced, and I've been teaching starting in, in, I started teaching during my doctoral program. So that probably would have been about 2014. So since then till about now, and as well as again, speaking, about, speaking um, on behalf of um, my, my communities, um, microaggressions are a real factor of something that, have made our experiences in academia um, not so pleasant. You know, as we're seeing now with the George Floyd protests, um, it has sparked a lot of people to speak up about their personal experiences. If you think of it in terms of the Me Too movement, one or two people spoke out, it started off slow in terms of expressing their um, personal experiences with the matter, and then it skyrocketed, skyrocketed. It started ballooning. Person after person started sharing, me too, I've experienced that. That has been something I've dealt with. In terms of microaggressions and race and academia, it kind of works the same way. Um, on my social media feeds, since everything has been happening, I've been seeing people sharing their personal stories of what they've dealt with. Um, and when I say microaggressions, um, so, you know, institutions that I have taught at, I've been one of the only or, you know, one of very few African American faculty members. And so I felt like the ways that I was treated compared to my colleagues was night and day. Um, I'd have things like a student would, would say, I didn't smile enough in class and feel prudent or felt it was prudent enough to, to file a complaint about something like that, or something like not referring to me as doctor on purpose. And I'm not one that gets caught up in titles and things like that, but it, it was very clear that that, that was the case. It, it was meant as a way to be demeaning almost. Um, there's a book that's called Presumed Incompetent. They're actually on number two now. How many of y'all have heard of that, that book before? Now we have a little hand raised <laughs> function here. Um, well, it is um, a, a very good collection of, okay, so we have a few. So we have um, it's a very good collection of stories from, again, this online community of particularly Black women faculty members sharing similar stories about um, how they're presumed incompetent, both in terms of their larger 
um, their peers as well as among students. Um, it was just assumed that we were there because we're minority hires and we're not competent enough to do our jobs. Um, you know, we're not one to be listened to. And, you know, that goes into this idea about this customer service mentality, I think is also very present um, in terms of being a black faculty member. The tides of academia, I think, have just changed across the board um, in, in many respects. But I think that particularly when it comes to black faculty members, we feel the need that we have to be people pleasers even more so than maybe some of our other faculty members of other demographics, um, out of fear of what could come if a student is unhappy for whatever reason. Um, I've had a student before, and I'm gonna try to, I guess, speak vaguely because I don't wanna you know, give any, any kind of personal information away. Um, but you know, going back to microaggressions and this idea. So a student, um, frequently misspelled my name. So my name is Janai Plattenberg. You know, it's, I know, I understand it's not the easiest name to pronounce, um, but it is Janai Plattenberg. And I teach journalism. And so, you know, in journalism, an important thing is to get names spelled right, right? Or you have to write a correction. There's some kind of repercussion if that's incorrect. Um, I had a student who, the student misspelled my name um, in a, a public setting. And I addressed it with the student, but the student uh, felt it felt the need to get up, to walk out of the classroom, and to go complain to uh, a higher authority that I told the student that they misspelled my name. And so, like that's something that I've never heard of. You know, any faculty member of other any other demographic having dealt with. Um, and the student was was very much so upset that you know I, I had the audacity to correct my own misspelled name, right? Um, and so in things like that and the countless other stories I've heard from my peers um, feed into this larger kind of narrative of uh, there's a clear difference in terms of how students and even how our peers. Um, how they can deal, how they can understand the experiences that we have to deal with at times. Um, and so a big part of that can come, or a big supporting factor of that can sometimes come from the lack of institutional support um, that I've heard colleagues speak about. Um, you know, I, I can complain that students or faculty members are, are doing or saying things that may be something that's mistreatment, um, but if I don't have the support of those I work with, that can be problematic. Um, a few other things just to kind of mention that faculty, black faculty members tend to, tend to experience, because um, I think sometimes these conversations are not had. And again, this is another reason why I'm glad that um, these discussions and webinars like this are happening more so now, because some of these things, folks might not have any idea that your black faculty members are experiencing currently. And so um, this idea of being a race ambassador, I don't know if that's something that you all have have heard being talked about. Um, as a black woman faculty member, again, being one of the only or the only in white spaces, um, I feel that it's important sometimes to speak up if I hear misinformation or to even say something or correct misinformation um, or to create spaces for some of my students of color. Um, while some of that may be included in my job description, certainly not all of that is. And so um, we like to sometimes say that that's almost like a black tax because it's something extra that we have to do um, that is kind of like an unspoken responsibility. And, you know, we want to do it, but it's something that if we're, we, there's only 100% of us, we're, di we're dividing ourselves out amongst all our responsibilities. That's something that we're taking, is taking away from other things that we may have to do. Um, something else that I, I think may often be overlooked when it comes to talking about recruiting black faculty members and retaining them is this idea of finances. Um, I think a lot of people in academia deal with this, particularly if you don't come from um, a rich background and you're coming into this as a new assistant professor, um, it costs money to go to conferences. 
it costs money to even sometimes move to wherever your new job may be. It costs money, it costs gas to get to the campus, right, in some cases. And so faculty members who may not be coming in with a good financial support or cushion, um, that can be very taxing. Even this idea of you pay for your conference or you pay for your organizational membership and will reimburse you can also sometimes be problematic. And I feel, you know, from my experiences and speaking with colleagues that we as Black faculty members and minority faculty members too, um, sometimes that becomes a burden that uh, prevents us from being able to go forward in ca our careers because we don't have the finances in place to do that. And if you have a system that doesn't support that or understand that, it can be problematic in terms of growth and retention for us. And so, um, and this whole idea again about lack of institutional support, um, this idea of mentorship being very important and also a community that embraces diversity. Um, it's very hard to be a black faculty member in a community that, and I'm not just speaking about on campus, but sometimes in the city itself, where you, again, may be one of the only. There's not anyone who can relate to, you know, what you're dealing with on an everyday basis, who's there physically, um, or there's, you may even go days without seeing someone who looks like you on campus, someone who looks like you in your building, and that can be kind of lonely. And so, you know, just keeping that in mind as that might be something that your colleagues might be dealing with. Um, and I don't want to go over time, so I'm going to try to do speed up just a tad bit here. Um, in terms of thinking about how can we rectify some of the shortcomings of um, lack of diversity in our, our you know, academic settings right now, um, something that I wanted to bring you know, to attention, your attention is this idea that black skin does not always equal an embrace of black identity. And so just, it's kind of akin to this, I have a black friend idea, uh, or, you know, concept that's, that's kind of been going around. Uh, we don't all think alike. Some people who are black in skin tone, you know, as Ngazi went through the definitions of race and ethnicity, um, just because you look black doesn't mean you necessarily identify as such. You don't embrace the, um, you know, community-minded uh, ideals of being a Black individual, you don't relate to that. And so keep that in mind that, you know, we're not all the same. Um, and I've also talked about the Black, I've already talked about the Black tax, but I'll just mention quite quickly this idea about working while Black um, and share a quote from you. Um, so there's a young woman who's a professor at uh, Virginia Tech named April, um, Dr. April um, Demo. And she said that in regards to activism, she said, how do I, as an assistant professor, tell such students that I do not have time to contribute to their professional growth? How I say no to a black community organization or church that asks for my time after I return home from campus? Why would I want to decline the chance to provide voice to the values I hold? Um, we as you know, black faculty members, again, going back to we want to be able to embrace our students, we want to be there, we want to provide a listening ear, um, good information, we want to be an advocate for them. Um, we like to do that, but our time is sometimes limited, but you know, it's just an added responsibility. And I, I don't want to say burden because it's not that, but it's an added responsibility to our day to day. And so deciding even do I want to engage in that, even if it doesn't have to do with a student? Do I want to go out and protest? Um, these are considerations that we have to keep in mind um, because of the possible repercussions that can come from that, either in the sense that we don't have enough time to do something else on our, our long to-do list, or even how it might be seen by higher ups um, going out and participating. And so um, even the act of maybe signing a document, you know, not even physically going out, but signing something can also be something challenging. And so before I wrap up, I did want to share something that you may have seen uh, on Twitter and really social media. There's been a movement that's been growing the last few days called Black in the Ivory. Have any of y'all seen that? No? Okay, well, I'll, I'll share this very quickly. Um, 
and you know if you get a chance to take a look at it that would be great um but as i was talking about a lot of us have the same sentiments in terms of experiences that we we dealt with um different microaggressions that we've seen and so we've all a lot of folks have come together to participate in this growing grassroots movement using the hashtag black and the ivory um as you can see they've got a, a page on twitter but I want to just share a few of the few of the, the stories that were shared here. Um, let me see. So on this way. So yesterday our group had much needed convos about tangible actions to take at work and in our professional societies. But today I'm getting pushed back about tokenism. I love to hear your thoughts or needed to see this. People think it's exhausting to confront systemic racism, but don't even think the toll of experiencing and now processing it 24 seven on top of your academic duties. And the list has just gone on and on and on for the last few days. Um, and so I encourage you to take a look at it because again, if you're, you know, I'm one person, um, and if it helps sometimes to see that message over and over and get an idea of what you can do, um, that would be a good thread to follow. And let's see. Um, also, very quick before I finish, so I also want to talk about um, I have a misspelling there, sorry. Um, just about some specific challenges that I feel that I face teaching journalism in this this current um, current day and age, um, and some also some advice of things you can do. So I, ex you know, we're we're preparing students to go into hopefully what will be diverse newsrooms going forward. Um, if you're so familiar with the American Society of News Editors, their original goal was for newsrooms to reach racial parity by 2000. That didn't happen. Um, the new goal being 2025. But now I'm faced with a dilemma of how can I promote and push diversity to my students and I'm preparing to send them into newsrooms that may not embrace them that may not value what they bring to the table. And so, you know, that's something that, uh-huh. We can't see your slides. Oh, sorry, let me, it says it's scan. okay, let me, let me, sorry. Okay, can you see it now? Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, so trying to figure out how can I prepare these students to go into a newsroom again that may not look like them or embrace their ideals. And so I try my best to get that started um, in the classroom, whether it's by including um, different ethnic media outlets in terms of what I'm discussing, um, whether it's assigning assignments that force students to go out into communities that they may not have previously had to um, uh, have any exposure or have any engagement with. Um, also, making sure that I'm, I'm bringing in diverse speakers, diverse examples from news coverage, things like that sometimes help. Um, in terms of exposing students and getting them prepared. And also just being honest about what life is going to look like post-graduation. Um, you know, as I said, it's difficult. We have these ideas about wanting to, you know, promote diversity in the classroom to have students feel comfortable engaging in these discussions, covering these communities that they may not have grown up in. Um, and we're having some pushback that comes with that. So I think that's that's kind of where we are. We're trying to find the best approach or best practices to get that done. Um, and so just a few other examples, making sure do the work in college, really listening to your colleagues when they, they're, they're sharing some of their personal stories or they're telling you that, um, you know, this has happened, making sure that you are keeping that in mind and possibly even implementing some type of repercussions as a department. Um, you know, this is a question that I asked my chair the other day of particularly what's going on. What happens if a student comes back in the fall and feels emboldened or enlightened to call me the N-word? It's not the first time I would have heard that. It's not the first time I would have been called that. But with 
people may be feeling um, more free to speak that way in, in public settings now, um, you know, what happens at that point? And these are discussions we're, we're trying to find answers to and trying to find um, an equitable way to deal with that. But we're in agreement that there has to be something done, right? And so maybe having those level of conversations with your colleagues about what happens if that's the case? What do we value as a department? What will we not stand for? Um, you know, of course we want students, we want them to graduate, but we can't have an environment where our faculty don't feel safe teaching. They lack academic freedom and they lack comfortableness being able to teach in an environment where they're not gonna be respected and their eyes and ideas embraced. And so that's all for me. Okay. All right, Dr. Fez, can you see them? Yes, can I can. Um, I'm not sure how to advance. How do I do that? I can just keep advancing for you. Okay. Want. All right, then. Uh, both of you have done a wonderful job of setting the pace for this webinar. I want to be sure, uh, make sure we have time to hear from the uh, audience. So I'm gonna move pretty quickly and because some you've covered some things that I was going to say. Oh. Well, let's go to the next slide. I just wanted to point out a couple, a few definitions and that is that, you know, diversity considers uh, differences between people whereas multiculturalism goes a little deeper than diversity by focusing on inclusiveness and understanding and respect, and also by looking at unequal power in society. So I think you all have touched on that. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, the American Council on Education, also known as ACE, and this is where all of our university presidents and chancellors, they're all usually members of this organization. In 2012, they gave these four points as to why they think uh, their board came up with these four points as to why they believe racial and ethnic di diversity matters. And instead of just reading each one here, I have a slide on each one that I'll go to. So let's go to the next one. Number one, diversity enriches the educational experience. And what that means is that we learn from those whose experiences and beliefs and perspectives are different from our own. And these lessons can be taught best in a richly diverse intellectual and social environment. Um, I just want to point out that there was a study that was done uh, that shows that greater ethnic diversity, uh, companies that, are, that have greater ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have better financial returns than their peers and companies with more gender diversity are 15% more likely to outperform their competitors. So, I'll hold on to that fact. Number the second one, go ahead. Also, diversity promotes social, personal growth and a healthy society. Um, once again, here we have to uh, remember that when you're in a diverse setting, when you have international students in this cl classroom setting, and uh, people in the classroom uh, who are from backgrounds that are not like yours. It's gonna encourage critical thinking and it's going to help you to communicate effectively with people from varied backgrounds. The US Census Bureau projects that by 2044, more than half of all adults in the United States will belong to a racial or ethnic group other than Caucasian. Next. Okay, um, diversity uh, also enhances economic competitiveness. I've already touched on that. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And diversity strengthens communities and the workplace. I can't say enough about how uh, being in a diverse college classroom and on a diverse campus, what it does for our students. It helps to prepare them to be good citizens in our increasingly complex pluralistic society. And it fosters mutual respect and teamwork, and it helps build communities whose members are judged by the quality of their character. So this is why we get into the inclusion. Next. Um, and by inclusion, I wanted to touch on uh, social media. That's something that our students 
must learn to deal with today in our uh, society. Um, next. As we know, social media is where teens and uh, young adults, the traditional age college students especially, it's where they uh, like to feature everything in their heads and hearts that they want people to know about. The central feature of these sites is the ability to connect with people and share information. And what we've been seeing since uh, over the last two weeks is that some of this information that they, uh, some young adults are sharing has cost them uh, handsomely. Next. Okay, um, in my original presentation that was uh, too big to send over email, I showed snapshots of uh, these top, these cases right here. And I found out just uh, going over everything last night that there's way more than the five that I chose from that happened between May 28th, which is about a week and a half ago, uh, and June 3rd. Uh, the one that really caught my attention was the one with the young lady who had gotten the offer from Xavier to be on the lacrosse team. And she, um, I, I may have a, no, it was Snapchat at Marquette. So anyway, make a long story short, the young ladies, uh, after other people saw what she posted on social media, and it was pretty vile also, and some of the alumni saw it, uh, the university had no other choice in their mind but to withdraw uh, or rescind her scholarship offer. And of course, there was a video circulating showing her she was really a basket case. And so what I tell young people is that, you know, free speech and the First Amendment and all the liberties we have there, it might be free, but it is not cheap. And in this case, my figures could be a little low, but uh, if you add up what she could have gotten for a four-year scholarship, it was well over $100,000. And so it's unfortunate. And being a diversity officer or former diversity officer, there's a part of me that thinks maybe uh, the university or someone should have, all of the young adults that I've seen who've made these mistakes should have been pulled to the side and someone should work with them instead of kicking them to the curve and you know getting rid of them from their universities because Here's what I'm thinking. As a person who is soon leaving her 50s and will be getting ready to be uh, an official retired person, these are the people who are going to be in charge of a lot. If someone hires them, they're going to be in charge of making decisions for us. And uh, like I said, I took the photos out that I was going to show. Some of them were so disturbing. I put it this way, one of the photos that a young man had spray painted on a building show, it said, uh, BLM doesn't matter, and he drew the KKK, and he was throwing, giving a thumbs up, and I believe he's only 18, and it reminded me, I hate to say it, it reminded me of photos where I've seen where there, have been, there were lynchings, and they burned the bodies of the people the, in, being lynched. And there were children in the photos and everybody was standing around as if it was a big social event. That's just how disturbing this is. And what our young people don't realize is that even though they might, might have gotten kicked out of this university and it happened when they were 18, you never know who's holding on to this stuff and archiving it. And you could finish and do okay at another university and it could come up um, when they're uh, interviewing you for a position. Uh, I hate to say it, but you can ask people not to go and research people on social media during the hiring process, but we do it anyway. I've seen it happen. Uh, when I was a diversity officer, I think we discouraged. Our rule was if you're going to research one person, and it, a lot of times it was that African-American person that everybody was suspicious about, then you must go and do uh, research other candidates also. That, that's what we encourage. So um, I, I wanted to mention that, uh, let's go to the next slide, I'm gonna uh, hurry. So these are some ways that institutions can strengthen commitment to diversity and inclusion. I won't read all of them. Just be a strong advisor and be aware that minority students and all first generation uh, college students are gonna need extra help planning for academic success. They might be able to get in, but they're gonna have issues that uh, students, 
who have come from a uh, household where the parent might have been is formally educated, they can help them na navigate the process, but there are going to be a lot of students who will not have that support. Uh, recruit diverse uh, employees, provide education and training for your staff, faculty and staff. And then when you do that, always assess frequently and give surveys. Um, Professor Plattenberg has already mentioned the hashtag Black and the Ivory. I strongly encourage that if you haven't followed that uh, hashtag on Twitter, just go and read some of it. And even uh, being in the academy as long as I have, when I saw some of it, I really became sad because uh, I people ha have to admit that those things have happened to them. And my last slide, slide uh, Ngozi, uh, these are just some things that we can encourage our young adults and um, non-traditional students to do as well to strengthen their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, the first one is to take advantage of opportunities to learn about people who are not members of your racial and ethnic or gender group. Still to this day, uh, 75 percent, um, most, more than half of the nation's school children are in racially concentrated districts where over 75 percent of students are either whites or non-white. In addition, school districts are often segregated, segregated, segregated by income. So, and I'm at a uh, predominantly white institution in Arkansas. To this day, I have students who come to campus and I'm the first black professor they've had. And um, so that is still uh, true and we need to be aware of that. I also encourage college students, I thought there would be some on this webinar, to enroll in courses and special trainings that focus on diverse topics. Um, it wasn't until I got into my doctorate program that I took a course on African Americans in the 20th century. Um, also, many schools and colleges offer trainings and workshops regard, uh, that look, uh, help you uh, learn more about cross-cultural sensitivity, unconscious bias, and, and other topics such as LGBT respect. Number two, avoid, if at all possible, watching, this is the media professor in me saying this, avoid watching only talk shows that feature people who think just like you and your mother and your father. For example, if you watch only, if you're the CNN mindset, go and watch some, as much as it might hurt you, be as painful as it might be, go and watch some of Fox News, just so that you'll know all the issues. And you just might hear something that will challenge the way you think. Uh, finally, number three to my college students, speak up when you witness someone making an insist, insensitive remark. Insensitive remark. This usually happens back home or around the dinner table or in private settings. And this, and you can speak up, speaking up is, can be done in more than, way, more than one way. For example, you can disassociate, uh, if that's a word, with people and organizations that promote prejudice, bigotry, or hate of any kind. Next, do not forward racist, sexist, or whatever a type of insensitive emails or text messages and block people who send that to you. Finally, do not post comments on racist, sexist uh, social media posts that give the appearance that you support the posted comment, the meme, the cartoon, the photo. In other words, protect your personal brand. It's going to follow you until you get to that job interview. You don't want people being, a, you want, don't want to be that uh, young adult who by the time you get there, everybody knows that you s use the N word and you did all of this and you don't want that on your record. So I'll just stop there. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Fears. So now we'll just go ahead and um, open up the forum for discussions and you know um other thoughts so if you have any comments that you want to add to the discussion um please feel free to go ahead and let's just discuss
Yes, Stephen, please. First, thank you all for this presentation. This is um, great stuff here. I really appreciate you all doing this. Um, I guess my question is, I'm at a small liberal arts college, private liberal arts college, so um, diversity just for our campus is a struggle. It's, we have a very small minority population, which I know the college is working on in and of itself. And so I'm relegated to helping in only ways that I can with what filters down when it comes to me and student media with an even smaller percentage of the population. How can I help to, given that I'm a small, again, the Broads College with very small minority um, population, how can I help to make a difference for those minority students that I have and, and help to empower them so they don't feel like they're in this, they're the only one in this thing and then they're, they're the, the token minority, whatever description they are. How, how do I do that being a middle-aged white guy who's grown up here in the South all of his life and don't want to come across as mansplaining or knowing better or superior or anything else like that, taking into account what they're thinking and feeling. Um, Dr. Fez, you want to jump in? Well, I think um, you have made the first step in recognizing that uh, you can help. Uh, once again, uh, I have been a, a diversity officer or an assistant to the provost as one. And one of the things I quickly realized is that uh, recruiting diverse faculty is, everybody is doing that. So I, I decided that what I needed to do was help the faculty that I had on my campus, including, which I'm mostly white, learn more about uh, diverse topics because if I waited until I got the perfect number of diverse people there, that was not going to happen. So I'll say to you, Professor Hames, um, having conversations, uh, ma making sure that they feel comfortable, uh, listening sessions, and when you get a chance to bring in diverse speakers, or if you have a lecture concert program, get their input on a speaker that they would have uh, and always just get their input uh, on things that you can do. And, uh, and, there, and there are also a lot of um, resources that you can um, purchase or order for your library. Uh, so those are just some things I can think of off the top of my head. And uh, maybe I could talk more with you on the side about, because I'm pretty sure there's some other things. I, I don't do, I'm back, m I, most of my responsibilities now are academic and I just work with faculty, diverse, fa uh, retaining uh, diverse faculty. So, but when I was in the office full time, I did some other things, but I'd be happy to follow up with you later. I, I'd like to add to that. Um, you know, although it might be uncomfortable um, when situations like, George Floyd's death happened or the Ahmaud Arbery death, um, just giving them a kind word and, you know, letting them know, like acknowledging the situation and not sweeping it under the rug, you know, even if it's just something, something simple as, you know, I'm keeping up with what's happening and, you know, voicing if, you know, it's a horrible thing. And if you need someone to talk to, I'm here and just letting you know, you know, I stand with you that something like that can speak volumes in terms of if, particularly if I'm a black student and there's no one else I feel comfortable going to, it opens the door of communication with you because I'm not, it makes me feel like I wouldn't be alone there. And same thing with, with your black co colleagues as well. That's right. 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 Yeah. Uh, Chris, you have something to say, Christopher? Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for the presentation. Really greatly appreciate it. So I recently graduated college um, this past May. And so um, I guess I'm just trying to still keep in touch and making sure that I can learn as much as I can while I'm still uh, in that mindset. I guess if I can say one thing really quickly to Professor Hames, coming from the perspective of a college student, I think one thing that we really appreciate is just any public uh, 
statement and it was previously mentioned in the the conversation of you know stepping in and saying when something is wrong um and i think just coming from that wholeheartedly uh honest intention is what we really appreciate. I mean, I go off of the perspective of that we recently had a professor in our chemistry department who made a really inappropriate comment. And so when something like that is made, you will certainly see that a lot of the, the, the dislike and distaste and a lot of outcry from the students will come out. But likewise, if you're coming more public forward and saying you're supporting the students and to some point challenging the administration, depending on what the structure is there, uh, just know that you would definitely get get um, a full appreciation uh, of the allyship of um, students of color. Uh, but transitioning to, to what I wanted to ask particularly is, so I uh, recently majored in, and completed my studies in communication and media studies. About four years ago, I was really passionate and really dead set about wanting to pursue journalism. But studying the landscape a little further and seeing that kind of the ethics of journalism transitioned into, you know, being a little bit more biased in, in having to create content of what is going to sell, whether it's just catching attention, is this something we can attach ads to, uh, et cetera. It seems like just what journalism was supposed to be back then, it, it, you know, talking more of the 70s pre-digital media ages, it, it just seemed like much simpler times. And right now with everybody just needing to be in the know, saying whatever comes to mind, saying whatever one or two sources say to them at the most, it just seems like the, the, the ethical practices have been lost. And I, you know, as a, as a Latino student, I got discouraged of wanting to pursue journalism any further because I didn't want to lose my integrity. And, and moreover, if I did keep to my full integrity and, and wanted to be neutral, obviously stepping in when I think there were moments of injustice, but it doesn't seem like there. it was a field that also made, uh, you know, not going to lie, it made enough income, made enough money. Like, it seems like it's going to be a, a task to task kind of situation. And myself coming from a, a low income background, I want to pursue a career that can provide me the most security. At least that's what my, my mindset is right now. So I wanted to ask, particularly for any of the, the presenters, if you guys have any recommendations or, or any advice for what is something that I can tell either to other fellow peers who are considering journalism or even myself, maybe if I want to get back a little bit out there uh, in my near future as to why uh, is it crucial th that I pursue a career like this? And, um, you know, what kind of information should I be sticking to, you know, if that makes any sense. Uh, There's a lot to impact there, unpack there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's full. Uh, but I'll just try to like maybe talk about some part of your question because it's a, it's a lot um, in there. Uh, so one thing to consider um, as um, a journalist is the fact that <clears throat> the stories that you tell are very, very impactful. And um, at a time like this, when we're talking about representations and having people who can tell your narrative and tell stories that will relate to, to you and that is very effective, um, the more representation you have in the media, the better. And if not for, I mean, I do understand the whole idea, the whole issue with pay, um, you know, pay differences and, you know, it doesn't pay so much. Just like um, um, academia, I always want to think about journalism as a service. Um, and that the job that we do, um, we all want the money, but sometimes it's way more than the money that we make out of it. And so um, the kind of representation that you can give, um, you who you understand um, the, the stories and the narratives that shape you and the narratives that you want to put out there and to give a balanced and an objective um, framework in your stories, I think that's something worth considering. I would also say, um, you know, to the, the financial aspect of it, um, think about how you can fill niches that are not currently being filled. You know, journal, a large part of journalism is about being innovative. Um, and so your contribution may not necessarily be that of a reporter. Maybe it's coming up with the next, 
way to tell a story, the next digital storytelling tool or something like that that can be uh, shared with other journalists of color to go out and report stories of their community. You know, what can you do to contribute that to that's not already there? Um, and so, you know, maybe it's starting a digital um, you know, media outlet or something like that, like that, something that has um, low overhead that can reach the masses. And so something like that can be your, your niche into, you know, contributing to journalism and keeping your lights on, right? And paying your mortgage. So um, yeah, so that might be another consideration as well. Oh, and also when it comes to fighting the good fight, right? Because I think that's what you were also getting to of, you know, what what can you do? You know, you feel disheartened about the the opinion and bias that you feel has kind of sunk into journalism these days. Um, you have to think about objectivity in terms of who's at the helm of the news organization, because this idea of objectivity is subjective in itself, depending on who is, whose ideology is running that media outlet. And so, you know, like journalism professors in the past have told me, um, if, you know, you're reporting on what's happening outside, and you can listen to everyone else, but use your own two eyes as well and see what's going on and report from that way. So, so sometimes opinion does have a place in terms of news coverage. And so, um, yeah, I hope that that helps somewhat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, so I'll raise my hand, but as a host, I, there's no hand raised. Um, in one of my introductory classes, we go through some of the history and one of the uh, pieces of video that I have shown over the years has been the video clip from All in the Family in which Sammy Davis Jr. is a guest star on that. And it, it, it very much deals with racism. Within it, Sammy Davis Jr. actually uses the N-word. And again, it's all to reflect back on how racist uh, Archie Bunker is. In today's world, is that something that you think I would still be safe to be able to show? Or automatically do you go, no way, don't show that? I'm of the mindset of show it. <laughs> um, and I don't want to take over. So if, you know, uh, you know Dr. Zakina or Fears, you want to chime in. Um, but I'm of the mindset of sharing things that can be controversial um, because it, it's real. It's some, and in that case, you know, that is a clip that aired on television. It happened. And so to ignore it is to make it seem like, you know, it, it's not worthy of discussion almost or to beat around the bush. Like there's no way to confront the issues or fix the issues that we're having today unless you confront it head on. And so I think that, you know, that can yield a, a healthy discussion. Now I wouldn't repeat the N word in class, but, you know, at least acknowledging it and having a discussion about it, I think can um, go a long ways in, um, you know, bringing about impactful conversations and discussions. Yeah, I agree with Janai. Um, I, I, I am of the same mindset. I think um, sometimes we kind of like shy away from those kinds of tough um, discussions just because um, you don't want to offend, you're trying to. Um, I don't think the idea here is that um, it's for us to sugarcoat things or walk on, you know, eggshell or anything. Um, so is, the idea is, you know, that can be an avenue for you to open up a discussion and students can talk about these things. And sometimes it's always about the how, how do we talk about these things? These are tough topics. These are um, you know, challenging topics and challenging time too, especially with social media, people with, with all their phones and things can be taken out of context, right? So like she said, maybe not say the word, but open up a discussion where, you know, so let's talk about this and then have a critical thinking moment going on for your students. That's how I approach it. Because whether we like it or not, it's there. People talk about it, people use these words. People, so um, if it can become, if it can be um, turned 360, where it becomes a teaching moment for students, I think that's not bad at all.
Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, well, I know we're like um, 11 minutes past one o'clock, uh, um, past the hour, it's not, depending on where you are. I'm in Texas, so it's uh -huh. past one. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we want to keep going, um, if we still have questions or um, what you all want to do at this time. Let's go uh, last call for any questions at this point. So does anybody have questions, comments, feedback? I do. Um, where will this recording of this whole webinar be posted after this? Um, we will send out the link via our listserv. Okay. Stephen, do you know if we're going to be putting this up on uh, the website? I don't know. That's probably more of a Chris or Jessica question. Um, they're the ones who kind of handle that. Um, I don't, uh, um, unless our speakers have any reason uh, against that, I, I think we could post it on the website as well. And I think that is fine unless there's any um, concern there. I know Dr. Plattenberg says <laughs> she's not tenure yet. So <laughs> I, I don't want to do anything that not that I'm I think not it's too. Controversial, but I, 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 don't to, I don't think there's anything controversial, but I don't want to speak and jeopardize you any. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried to, to be very careful, so I think I'm okay. Okay, yeah, so we will distribute this widely. Our uh, webinars, uh, the live aspect is for our members, and then we uh, distribute the recordings to others so that uh, all can join in. So, well, I want to thank you today. Uh, obviously, I had to step away for a few minutes, but I was just right out there and got to hear most of it. Fantastic discussion, and it's going to, uh, a lot of that information is going to be great to use in the class this fall, and uh, what a timely topic that we're talking about. So, thank you, everyone, uh, uh, to our panelists. Thank you for being here. Remember, on Tuesday, June 23rd at 1 o'clock, Sound Exchange uh, will be our topic. And uh, certainly, we'll be talking about the new five-year agreement and the new costs that are involved with that. So thank you for joining a CBI webinar. We will hope to be talking to you soon. And again, a great thank you to our panelists. And have a great day. Thank you.